Well, good morning and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church. Thank you so much for being with us on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. We invite you to uh, not only be with us during our worship time together, but also to come on over to the Fellowship Hall following our worship service, where we have some uh, refreshments and I have a chance to greet you a little less formally. Thank you so much for continuing to wear the masks as uh, we try to be as safe as possible together during this uh, pandemic time. I... Today we will also be having the second session of our Inquirer's class. The Inquirer's class is for persons who are interested in finding out more about our church and considering becoming members of our congregation. That will begin in the conference room in our office complex uh, about 15 minutes after the uh, conclusion of our worship service. We invite you to come over and join us at this time. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, on this beautiful day we are reminded of the beauty of the creation that you have entrusted to us. We rejoice, Lord, to find your spirit at work in our midst, giving us reasons to look for the future with hope. Be with us now as we gather together to bring honor to the name of Jesus, to glorify you, and to share together that we indeed are your treasured people. Bless us, Lord, that we might be instruments of your blessing. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our opening song.
I've been in ministry now for uh, 42 years, and over the, 40, the course of the 42 years, I think I have officiated at pretty close to about uh, 180 weddings. And weddings can be all types of events. Some of them are very simple and ordinary. Others are extravagant and almost mind-boggling in the uh, scale of it. And I'm sure you've probably involved in uh, some weddings that have been memorable occasions to you. Certainly your own wedding would be a memorable occasion, but sometimes when you just go and are, are a guest and invited to celebrate with the nuptials for others, it becomes just really an, an extraordinary event. Uh, when John begins his gospel in describing the ministry of Jesus, he talks about a memorable wedding that Jesus was at. And so I invite you this morning to uh, follow along with me as we read from the second chapter of John, the first 11 verses that describe an extraordinary wedding that Jesus was at. Listen for the word of the Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding in, the Can day in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour is not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars for Jewish rites of purification each holding between 20 and 30 gallons. Jesus said to the wine steward, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And then he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it, and when the steward tasted the water, it had become wine. And he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, You know, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have had become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we take a look at these ancient words, it is our hope and prayer that we will also hear your voice speaking to us this day. Touch, renew, and refresh us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if you're like me, but I have to say that this story sort of makes me a little uncomfortable. I mean, why did John decide to tell this story as a first story about the ministry of Jesus. I mean, first of all, it just seems to be a little too m magical. I mean, it, here you have Jesus turning an extraordinary amount of water into an extraordinary amount of wine. And you'd think if you're really introducing Jesus' ministry, you'd probably think that there ought to be something a little bit more significant than that. It, it, it really seems sort of frivolous. I mean, think about it. Jesus makes between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. Convert that into bottles, that's between 1,000 and 1,500 bottles of wine for a wedding. It just sort of seems a little, little frivolous, a little magical, a, a little just not quite worthy, you'd think, of the introduction of Jesus' ministries. And then oh, there's also this sort, sort of shade in there about sort of what some of the relationships are. Jesus' mother comes to him and says, there's a, there's a crisis here. I, I mean, we got to make sure that people are taken care of in a celebration like this, but they're, they're out of wine. And Jesus responds in a way that sounds a little brusque to our ears. Woman, what's that to us? This is not what my ministry is about. My time has not come yet. It seems a little, a little awkward at the best. 
And then Mary says to uh, the servants after this conversation with her son, just listen to Jesus and do whatever he says. So why? Why do you suppose John chooses to tell this story as the introduction to his description of who Jesus is and what Jesus' ministry is to be about. I want to suggest he's doing this by organizing his material around different themes. If you look at the Gospel according to John, it's arranged in different sections. And this section is the introduction. It's called the first sign, and it has a conclusion and after about uh, 10 chapters of a final sign that is done before the story of Jesus going into Jerusalem. In short, this is done as a bookend to try to give a thematic introduction to what the materials in the middle are all about. And what I think is going on here is John is using this story, trivial or not, to introduce the major theme that God's transforming power is at work through Jesus. He is introducing that Jesus changes life. That the Spirit of God that is experienced in and through Jesus makes life-changing difference. That's what's highlighted there in the 11th verse. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, and revealed his glory And the disciples believed in him. It sets the theme that Jesus can transform lives. So how does Jesus transform lives? What difference does Jesus make to you and me, to those who will follow Jesus? That's what Paul is talking about when he's talking to those first century Christians about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he puts it this way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Jesus changes lives. And I think he does it in a couple of different ways. The first is how I see my circumstances and myself. God, through Jesus, we understand who we are and what we can become. First, God frees me from my past. All of us have a history. All of us have a heritage. Some of that involves reasons for strength and encouragement and hope. Sometimes that history includes mistakes that we have made, disappointments that we have experienced, hurts that we had suffered. And the issue is, how much does that history, that past, define us? How much does that set the boundaries and the borders of what possible in the future? And what Jesus' ministry, life, death, resurrection and commission mean is that our history our past is history but no more the future is open and god's creativity can make the future different paul talks about it this way in his letter to the church at philippi in philippians 3 12 through 14 he says i do not to claim that i have already succeeded or already become perfect. The thing I do, however, is to forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. So I run straight toward the goal in order to win the prize, which is God's call through Christ Jesus to the life above. In short, what Jesus lets us know is that the future is open and God is at work helping us build it with hope. Our past will always be a part of us, but it need not define us or what is possible. So what is God doing to make sure that that future can be different, that we can become better? 
And what the ministry of Jesus is about is that when we discover that the Spirit of God is at work in our lives, it can begin to perfect my character. It can make me realize the hope of becoming the type of person that I would like to be. The way Paul describes that is using a term called fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit are the character-building characteristics that God can make possible in our lives. And he talks about it in his letter to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, he describes it this way. I like the way it's uh, translated in the message. Eugene Peterson translates it this way. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives. Much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion of the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and develop our energies wisely. What both Paul and Jesus are saying is, what is the type of person you would like to become? Would you like to become the type of person who exercises and lives compassionately? And that compassion is not limited just to people that I like. Instead, it is an expression of who I am and what I treasure. Do I want to have a joy in life that's not just determined by what are the circumstances that we are in, but find every moment both challenging and rewarding to be an occasion that is precious and I can find joy? It says that I can have a patience that doesn't need to make things work on my schedule. I'm not ruled by time. I consider it. I utilize it. I know when things have to be done. But it is not what drives my life. I want to be the type of kind person that can make a community possible where others know that I treasure them and when I offer my counsel and advice, it is done with their best interests at heart. I want to have the type of faithfulness and fidelity that makes it possible for others to see that I am worthy of their trust. I want to exercise my strengths, always under control, so that what I do and how I do it is something that is used as benefit for others. And what happens is that Jesus' ministry, what John is saying about Jesus in his gospel, is that just such transformations can take place. We can be freed from our past, and we can be perfected in our character as we build that future moving ahead. And what John is saying is this transformation starts when I choose to follow Jesus. You see, Jesus always offers the invitation, but does not compel compliance. Indeed, that is the story of the entire Bible. Jesus and God offering invitation, but awaiting our response and our participation. In the last few verses of the book of Joshua, back in the Old Testament, it tells the story of when the people of Israel finally realized their hopes and dreams after having escaped from Egypt and now have finally reestablished the homeland that they have sought for generations in uh, the promised land. And once they have gotten settled and ready to go, Joshua appears before them and issues this invitation and challenge. He says in the uh, 24th chapter, the 15th verse, you know what God has done for us. Now choose this day for yourselves whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The beginning of discipleship is a choice that is made. 
will we choose to follow Jesus? And that leads to then the second thing. How does this transportation, transformation take place? And it is a willingness, first, to follow Jesus, but second, a willingness to change. A willingness to become something more than I am. When Jesus is, his ministry is summarized in Matthew, in one sentence, the simple sentence is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent, because God is at work right here. So what does it mean to repent? I think there are three aspects of what Jesus is asking of us, what John the Baptist uh, proclaims when the uh, Paul and others uh, explaining what it means to be a follower of Jesus begins by saying repent. And repentance has really three aspects to it. The first is I accept responsibility for who I am and what I do. I don't excuse it for others have made me this way. I take responsibility for my own life. I acknowledge that in the end, I am the person who is responsible for me. Second, when I have done something that hurts others, I will do my best to make them whole. My responsibility is to take responsibility, but also to make restitution when it is possible. But third, and the critical part of repentance, is resolve. Resolve that the future will be different. That I am committed to making sure that I will do as much in my, po my, as my ability as possible to do things differently. You see, repentance is less about regret than it is about resolve. And when Jesus calls us to repent, it is I take responsibility for my life. I will see how I have impacted others. But my resolution for the future is that when people know that I am a follower of Christ, not only will I do what he asked me to do, but I will live in such a way that it will bring honor to the name of Jesus. Now that's a major challenge. That is a life changing challenge a life transforming challenge but the thing is we're not left just on our own to make it happen the third part of this transformation takes place after i've chosen to follow jesus after i have been willing to change is that i will stay connected with god i will make it so that it is god's spirit and presence in my life that will make possible even what I cannot do myself. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, that fruit of compassion, joy, patience, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the things that are made possible when we stay connected with Jesus, allow God's Spirit to be at work in our lives and shape our lives with the expectation that God is with us. So, on this day in our inquirers class, persons will be asked to express, do they wish to follow Jesus? And it will be their choice. And that is the same choice that each of us has. But if we are willing to follow Christ, willing to be changed by God's Spirit and to be connected, it makes it possible to celebrate every day, even when the wine runs out. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we give you thanks that you offer us this reason for hope, that we can become all that we hope and yearn to be, that we can discover your values your purposes, and your spirit at work in us. This, Lord, is a blessing that we gratefully receive, and we understand it is a blessing that we are a part of, where we will become your instruments of blessing to others. Thank you, Lord, 
for that confidence you have shown in us and that future that you promised to us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. One of the ways that we give expression to that commitment to follow Christ and the openness to that spirit is by opening our hearts in prayer with the expectation that God is with us and involved in making that future. We are invited to share what's on our hearts both in terms of celebrations of good times and asking for God's patience, strength, wisdom, and guidance in facing challenges. And so this morning, I want to invite you, if you have a reason for uh, giving us uh, something to focus our prayers upon, we have received uh, two requests already from uh, Linda Bradley, 
First, they have a friend, Devin, who was in a motorcycle accident and is now in a coma in ICU fighting for his life. And then also Jean's brother, Thomas Maloney, is in the hospital fighting fluid in his lungs. Are there any other requests that you have for our focus of our prayers this morning? Yes, Terry. Oh, and his name is? Stan. Stan, thank you. Yes, I heard this morning that a group of Christian uh, missionaries in Haiti have been kidnapped. And so we need to pray for their release. And then I also would like prayer for my sister-in-law who has had a stroke. And her name is? Jane. Jane, thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear your name? Ever. Ever. Thank you. Yes? Continue prayers for my Aunt Diane battling cancer. Thank you. Prayers for Monica, who's going to have a double Then let us take a moment to talk with God. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, we rejoice in the gift of life, which we receive by your grace, and the new life that you give in Jesus Christ. We take stock, Lord, of the reasons to give thanks for the love of our families, for the affection of our friends for the strength and abilities to serve your purposes and realize our potential, for this community in which we live and this church to which we belong, for the opportunities that you are given to us that we might discover what is possible. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to be instruments of your grace and to your care. We pray, Lord, for Thomas, for Devin, for Monica, for Sherry's mother and sister, for Jane, for Diane, for all family members, friends whom we know who need your healing grace. We pray, Lord, that you will guide the doctors and staff that attend them, that they might be instruments of that healing. We pray for all families and those who offer support and encouragement because your, your spirit is felt in those expressions of love. We pray, Lord, for those persons who have been kidnapped in Haiti, that you might protect them and hold them safe and in your care and that they may be rescued and return to loved ones soon. We pray, Lord, that you will be with each of us and all whom we love. In the quiet of this morning, Lord, we raise before you those things that are on our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you. Continue to be with us this and every day as we follow your son Jesus, who taught us this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and join together for our closing song. Please come on over and join us for a cup of coffee or other refreshments over in the fellowship hall. We've been gathered here as a family of faith, and we go out into the world now as the ambassadors of Christ. Jesus asked us to render to no person evil for evil, but to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to honor each and every person that we meet as a brother or sister in Christ. And Jesus also promises that if we're willing to do that, we will discover that the Spirit of God, the transforming Spirit of God, will be at work in and around and through us. So now may God our Father, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Savior and our Lord, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.